Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, great. Yeah, so thanks for inviting me to um, give this presentation. I wasn't 100% sure that, that uh, about the remit, but what I've interpreted it as is, yes, that interdisciplinarity first, and then why working with, you know, people that work in this environment area, which I do. Um, so yeah, so I'm based at the University of Exeter down in Cornwall. Um, I'm going to see if I, my slides will progress. There we go. Um, we'll see if we can get rid of that. So I, I was going to take you through, you know, how I ended up working in an interdisciplinary space, and um, because I think it's all very well to say we can we can work in an interdisciplinary way, and it's obviously we appreciate the benefits of working in an interdisciplinary fashion. But so I started off as a marine biologist, which I think actually, although we think that interdisciplinarity is new, if you think about some of these old, older, more old-fashioned sort of natural science-focused degrees, you know, there was biochemistry and earth sciences and soil science and chemistry, zoology, physiology, immunology, all the rest of it. So I then went on to do a PhD actually in fish parasitology, but then that was my first sort of coming into thinking about infection. And that happened to be a, a prot protozoan or a protistin parasite. So I ended up working um, on in protistology, um, going to protistology meetings, which was discussing how evolution of eukaryotes evolved and then I ended up in Japan um, working in a marine science institute but also working with natural history museums so by the time I'd finished my first postdoc I think already I'd done quite a lot of different things which you know could could, could have been seen as a disadvantage I then spent a lot of time at, at the University of Warwick and that's when I really first started working on microbial ecology which I think is at the heart really in some ways and of, of, of what we should be thinking about now. It, in terms of microbiomes, this whole idea of microbiomes um, and, and even the clinical microbiome research was being presented in this, uh, this Society for Microbial Ecology. I then was very fortunate to have a, a one-year dis discipline hopping grant funded by NERC's Environment and Human Health Programme. Um, so I spent a year working in Heartland Hospital um, with Peter Hawkey, who's the uh, UK HSA or equivalent microbiologist. And then for the last 12 or so years, I've been working in a Centre for Environment and Human Health at the University of Exeter. So in this time, I've worked with chemists and um, mathematicians, uh, you know, policy people. And, re and really, I, th I think, you know, almost as, as broad as you can, you know, as many different disciplines as you could think. But really, I think it, it really opens your eyes to the possibilities of dealing with something large and complex like antimicrobial resistance. So, Transdisciplinarity, so that's interdisciplinarity plus this cross cross sectoral working, which I think, of course, we all acknowledge now is critical. So, again, you know, work for, from my experience working with these super um, national organisations, um, you know, at, at European level, working across different departments, um, in, at UK level, working in the in the in the overseas aid um, area. Of course, working with the research councils themselves on sort of um, discussing what priorities should be, working with industry, and the most recently that I've, has been a real eye opener for me is um, working with the investment industry and and how actually working with investors can really pr provide um, societal levers to really try and um, in, 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 improve the way that we can deal with antimicrobial resistance from a from a, in a really joined up way. So just three examples of this, I've was work, been working with FAIR, who um, is a $70 trillion invest, investment network focused on the um, intensive food production. Um, and then there's the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, who are really interested in AMR. And then um, working with Aviva Investors, where I contributed to this report on the links between AMR, climate change and biodiversity. So, I, of course, these are my personal experiences, but I think just I'm trying to illustrate you know, how enriching it has been working in this interdisciplinary space. And it's not necessarily easy. You're out of your comfort zone all the time. You don't understand the language people are talking, you, you know, and I, I've, you just have to say, I don't understand what you're saying and please explain it to me. You're always the person in the room maybe that knows least about what the other person's talking about. But um, in some cases, I think it takes imagination. You've got to really imagine these huge scales in terms of complexity and spatial scales and, and to time. And also time is, it takes time to develop interdisciplinary working. 
Um, and I think that can be a real, you know, that can put people off getting involved in it these days when you need to have such fast, you know, productivity and um, return on whatever you've been doing. So network, I think really critical. I've worked, you know, run, run small networks. This is, this is the driver of interdisciplinarity, arguably. Um, I'm part of a DW4 network across four universities, and we have a, a network at Exeter, which is, crosses all of these different areas from AMR to social sciences, whatever. So I'm just showing these again as examples of, this is the sort of logical conclusion, I suppose, networking of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary working. So yeah, how to bring new people into discussions rather than talking to the same people about the same things. And why, why the environment? So I think often that's lost on people. And I think that's partly the way that um, the environment and One Health is discussed. So principally, why environment? Because many of the resistance mechanisms that are emerging in human pathogens now, those genes have evolved over evolutionary time in environmental bacteria. So this is a, this is a figure from Jerry, a paper by uh, Jerry Wright. So evidence for the for the origin of metallo of uh, beta lactamases, for example, two billion years ago. So we can't really think about resistance in a joined up way without thinking about how these resistance mechanisms evolved in the first place, how they move around, how human behaviour drives that um, enrichment and transmission, and then all those chains of events that end up to emergence in human pathogens. I think really it's, a, you know, I'm, I'm promoting an, a way of thinking where we really do see uh, AMR as an emerging pandemic. And if you think about these sort of um, figures which illustrate how viruses emerge and then become spread, you know, um, globally, the same is true for resistance. You know, we have these plasmids and mobile genetic elements which are very close related to plasmids, um, we believe. These are they're hugely diverse and abundant um, uh, resistance mechanisms and mobility mechanisms within environmental microbial communities. But how do these then emerge in human pathogens? You know, where, where is selection and transmission? Is it only in the human microbiome that selection is so important, but is it also in animal and environmental microbiomes? And then all those things that we're doing to um, potentiate transmission between them. So I think really this is useful to present it, present it in this way rather than saying it's just about environmental health. So again, some of you will have seen this figure from a paper by Linton in 1977. So the only, the only change arguably I'd make here is a circle here, which is, this is a selective pressure that he's put. So strong selective pressure or weaker selective pressure in white. You know, these ideas around One Health are not new. This is 45 years old and probably wasn't new then. But I think it's useful to remember, remember that. So recently, um, I've, myself and a few, a few people have been thinking about One Health and having these three overlapping Venn diagrams as previously and say, well, this is environmental health, this is animal health, and this is human health. Actually, that detracts from the message that really it's all linked. So we've, we've suggested that uh, you should maybe a, an alternative way of thinking about One Health is to actually think about you know, think about the environment is actually the matrix within which humans and animals live. It's, it's the origins of resistance, of some resistance, of course, not mutation under chemotherapy in the clinic, but from these ancient resistance genes, which then adapt once they are, are exposed to clinical selection pressure. So it's a, it's a slightly different way. So I don't see the environment as something added on or of, of sort of remote interest because it's something to do with the health and the environment. It's fundamentally central to understanding antimicrobial resistance, evolution, and transmission. And then, so finally, you know, this is another. This is a similarity. I just got this off the inter, off the internet. This idea of planetary health. Maybe you know now, if we were thinking about how we framed the environmental dimension of antimicrobial resistance, it might be as planetary. You know, how planetary health or a planetary health context or way of thinking about it. And, you know, evolution ecology has to be at the centre. That's what that's essentially is what's driving the, 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 you know, the complex pandemics. Microbiomes at the heart, not just human microbiomes, but animal and environmental. We need to think about environmental change, pollution, the impacts, 
agricultural food production, of course, transdisciplinary working as at the, is at the heart of all of this. Policy, you know, how, the drivers, economics, economic drivers, climate change, of course, and I would say drug resistant infections. We, we do all this through the lens of trying to understand how the environment is, is, is its role in emerging um, resistance in human and animal pathogens. Okay, so that's the end of mine. Thank you very much. Thanks, Will. That was great. Um, really appreciate that. We've got a few minutes for questions now. We've got about five minutes. So if there's one or two um, questions, if anyone would like to ask, if they could just raise their virtual hand, that would be really helpful um, using the icon at the bottom of the screen. Just flicking through the pages. Doesn't look like there's any burning questions for Will, so maybe we'll just move on. Um, but thank you very much for that, Will. That was really great, excellent presentation. Um, I forgot to mention the each of these talks today are 10 minutes. And when you for the presenters, when you hit your 10 minute mark, I, I, I will raise my virtual hand just so you're aware of the timing. Um, and we do have five minutes after each presentation for a few questions if anyone's got anything they want to ask to the presenter in today's meeting. But obviously, please do feel free to get um, in touch in an offline capacity as well. So we'll just move on to the next talk. So that's Claire Chandler. Incredibly efficient, Claire. <laughs> You've already started sharing. That's great. Thank you. So um, if you want to get going, Claire, that's fine. I can see your screen. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. That's great. Thanks, Claire. Um, so I'm Claire Chandler. I'm a professor in medical anthropology, which is one of the social sciences. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about um, interdisciplinarity and AMR from a social scientist um, perspective. So we all know that interdisciplinarity is uh, critical to uh, addressing antimicrobial resistance. And this is one of the many different versions of these kind of pictures that Will was just talking about, about uh, the different ways that people have tried to assemble the complexity of, uh, of antimicrobial resistance and its drivers and the potential interventions. Um, social sciences, uh, is actually quite a big area in AMR <clears throat> now, I would say, and it's quite a, a vibrant community um, of uh, people working in really quite different disciplines. So the first thing I just wanted to point out is that within the social sciences, there's quite a big job to do in, um, in collaborating and working across uh, different fields. Um, I've included uh, an adapted figure. Um, this figure uh, was, used for a completely different purpose, not antimicrobial resistance, but I thought it was quite a nice way of organising crossovers. So I've edited it to have um, what I think are uh, the dominant social sciences and the crossovers with different uh, fields here. And I think um, the first point to make is that even within the social sciences, we come from really quite different backgrounds and different ways of thinking about the world. So that's already quite an important set of cross sections. And then we have the crossovers with um, the creative arts and design, with the humanities and with STEM um, in areas that, uh, you know, all collectively within that blue background, trying to address antimicrobial resistance. And that uh, therefore is really quite a challenge, this idea of trying to do interdisciplinary working when each of those uh, in, that, in those lists has a huge background to it and, and a, quite a different um, body of, of work that it builds on. Um, I will flag that the, we created a website called the Antimicrobials and Society, uh, org website. It is a bit out of date because I haven't updated it for a while, but it is quite a useful resource of different people, projects, readings and events from across different social sciences and AMR. Um, and we did a series of webinars. You can see the speakers in the, in the middle, listed in the middle there. Um, where people were sharing their research findings around what to do about antibiotic use. 
um, and that's across different countries, uh, including in the UK. And we brought together those findings from across different fields in this report that I've made a picture of on the left. Um, and I can also flag that there are other networks of social scientists, including the International Network of AMR Social Sciences um, and some other networks that are operating in different countries. Um, but that's kind of maybe other networks to, to consider connecting the proposed networks within. So we think about two areas that I think um, we really need to think about if, in answer to this kind of call. The first is synthesizing what we know, and the second is working together for solutions. Um, so a key challenge for all of us in AMR is to synthesize what we already know. We've generated enormous amounts of research evidence from across our different disciplines, and I'm sure there is not one single person who would know it all, um, but collectively, we want to you know, have a better sense of what each other have learned <clears throat> over the last decades in this area. Um, <coughs> and this figure was one that we made for um, a recent article, which was based on some of the challenges we were having around trying to pull together research evidence um, around uh, IPC, which is what we tend to call infection prevention control in hospitals. We were also trying to look at IPC, which is called biosecurity, uh, in, in agricultural communities. Um, and just looking at all of those different types of, in this case, we were looking at interventions at the crossovers is a huge, is huge, a piece of work to kind of conceptualize, but methodologically really challenging. So I think one of the key things we need to be collectively thinking about is what kinds of methods can we use for doing our syntheses that aren't just, you know, just using a kind of Cochrane review type method is not gonna be enough to really get at the different, the nature of information that is being brought forward by different, um, different groups of researchers from different backgrounds. Um, you know, we often have different multiple AMR outcomes. It might be around antibiotic use, or it might be around different kinds of AMR, but also we often have multiple consequences for interventions. And these really need to be uh, brought into conversation with each other. We can't just, uh, with a complex problem like this, imagine that we're talking about um, solely the impact on AMR and then that's job done. Um, as we know, for example, with COVID, infection control is an area where, for example, non-pharmacological interventions were very controversial and um, because they have a significant impact on lives that goes well beyond microbial life. Um, so we really have to be thinking about, um, you know, how do we bring evidence together in a way that actually can be propelled into, um, you know, open, uh, decision making around what to do uh, for AMR um, and walk, working together for solutions. I think um, there's sort of two parts of that again. And the first thing is actually deciding what the challenges that we're working towards. I think we can all say from our experiences with doing interdisciplinary work that it is um, working towards a challenge really helps us to, to collaborate together. So we can work towards a challenge um, a, around AMR, but it's not always um, as obvious it might, as it might seem as to how we define what that challenge is, because how we frame those, uh, that challenge um, really comes with a lot of baggage, which we may or may not recognise. And social scientists are very good at helping to see what that baggage is, the expectations, the influences, the orientations, um, and where that, you know, those, the biases that we have in the way that we ask our questions can lead us and what we might be obscuring. So um, that first step of defining what our challenge is, is really important to do in an interdisciplinary way. But then of course, collaborative working on the ways that we see potential solutions and working out what the consequences would be to, um, to using those, those different solutions and um, using the different exper expertise of different disciplines. Um, and within this, you know, we would always, as social scientists, promote end, end users as collaborators, as well as those from different disciplines. Um, and as an example, we might want to consider this question, um, which might also be a network, um, of how do we plan for a future with antimicrobial resistance? And that comes from a place of recognizing that current global and national plans on AMR really focus on mitigation. It creates AMR as a solvable problem. But if we accept that we will have AMR in the future, then planning for it in a more pragmatic way 
might be something we actually need to be doing and that we're not attending to due to the way that we're framing the kind of problem that it is. And so um, it, rather than simply attempting to detect and reduce the emergence and transmission of drug resistance, we want to also reduce the harm from resistance by replacing ineffective antimicrobials with new medicines. But if the in inevitability of antimicrobial resistance is accepted, then there's a need also for a focus on adaptation and prioritization is required to guide resource investment and to be best prepared to cope with resistance in the future. So to answer this would require bringing together scholars from across disciplines to consider the course of resistance in the coming decades and map out the likely drug bug combinations that will be most concerning in terms of disease burden. Um, and for each of these, evidence for options of mitigation and ad adaptive action that could then help us to have a roadmap um, to provide evidence for the safest and most cost-effective and equitable ways to implement these actions in the future. Um, and I think it's important about that point about the most equitable ways to, to have a transition into this future with AMR. We don't place nearly enough attention on um, inequities in the ways that we're addressing this problem. Um, and colleagues um, from uh, the University of Oxford and elsewhere have been uh, getting together to look at this idea of a just transition approach borrowed over from climate change. And I think for any of us who are thinking about how we work together towards AMR um, solutions, that we consider how that, what we're doing has other impacts and the trade-offs. And that's a really critical thing to do interdisciplinary working around. This is my last slide, just in memory of Henry Bullell, who also worked with Will, um, who died uh, very recently. And many of you will have known him as an active member of our UK AMR community. And his work was driven by a focus on interdisciplinarity. He himself was a more than human geographer. And ultimately, he said that where successful interdisciplinarity becomes a new way of, of doing things, um, he sought to conceptualize interdisciplinarity as a practice that draws out of, but operates differently from mainstream di disciplinary investigation. Interdisciplinarity becomes the search for an adjustment between fragments of disciplines, which has the potential to then transcend the original disciplines. Um, and this was a figure from uh, uh, one of his papers from 2008. Um, and I would encourage you to have a look at it and think about lively interdisciplinarity. Um, um, that's my talk for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Claire. Uh, really interesting presentations and excellent questions raised. Um, does anyone have any questions for Claire at this point in the workshop? Uh, just raise your virtual hand if you do. So I'm not seeing any virtual hands being raised. So if everyone's okay with that, I'm going to move on. Uh, once again, thank you, Claire, for your presentation. That was great. Um, so next we have uh, Danish Malik, who's going to talk to us. So yeah, please get started when you're ready. Hopefully you can see my screen. Um, firstly, thanks very much for inviting me to come and uh, share with you, um, you know, what I do, as well as some thoughts around interdisciplinarity, working with different colleagues from different disciplines has certainly helped me a lot in uh, some of the work that uh, I have been doing. So my area of focus is the development, the manufacturing, the formulation, encapsulation and targeted delivery of biotherapeutics particularly bacteriophages, which are bacterial viruses, very specific. Uh, a particular bacterial virus will only target a very small subset uh, of bacterial strains. So Staph aureus phage might only target a very small set of uh, Staph strains or an E. coli phage might only infect a small proportion of E. coli strains. So against the backdrop of antimicrobial resistance, uh, I realized as a, a chemical engineer that I could uh, use my knowledge and toolbox and think about if these new types of biologics, whether they're phages or bactericins or endolysins or whatever they are, uh, they would they will they may be needed 
uh, by society in large quantities and therefore I wanted to use my knowledge and understanding to think about what would be needed to manufacture them if we're going to evaluate them in uh, clinical models, small animal models. Uh, there are some challenges around uh, their delivery, their protection from manufacturing and environmental stresses. And that sort of led me, um, I was fortunate enough in 2016, 17 to get a Bridging the Gaps EPSRC funded network. It was a network plus, so I could host workshops, invite colleagues to come over, uh, to clinical stakeholders to present the problem as they saw it, and looking at different clinical areas, pulmonary, wound, soft tissue infections, uh, gastrointestinal infections, we tried to better understand the problem from different perspectives. Uh, and some of that then led to collaborations over the past five years that I have really benefited from. And I thought I'd give you some examples of those uh, today, just to show you how one can benefit from working uh, with different disciplines. So my area is very much looking at how we can make bacteriophages or new types of biologics, uh, particularly to be able to make them using good manufacturing practice uh, uh, for clinical trials or also for veterinary and other applications. So I'll show you how I've been working with engineering and physical scientists to better improve how we monitor and control bioreactors where these bacteriophages are manufactured. I've been looking at mapping the process flow sheet to look at which types of operations can be optimized and how they can result in production of well-characterized high quality phage drug substances. Uh, and then I'll show you some examples of how I've been working with uh, chemists and form formulation scientists to improve phage stability, to encapsulate them in micro and nano capsules with synthetic biologists, my collaborator, Antonio Sagona at Warwick. We've been looking at uh, delivery of these phages to look at intracellular infections, something that I wouldn't have been able to do. So by working with different disciplines, it really allows one to work on interesting problems uh, and apply one's own knowledge and understanding. But as my colleague earlier said, uh, a lot of the times, you know, I don't understand everything about the problem uh, and that can be quite interesting in, its, in itself. So I do uh, work across the manufacturing, the encapsulation, the formulation side, but across different therapeutic areas, including working with clinicians at um, Swiss Medic and ETH Zurich, Martin Lossner's group, looking at delivery of phages to target urinary tract infections with the Queen uh, Astrid Medical Hospital, University of Leuven, looking at phages for pulmonary delivery, and also uh, uh, the US Biological Defense Directorate, looking at soft tissue infections. So we're looking at applying phage therapy and the use of phages uh, um, in, in a number of different settings. So on the manufacturing side, um, I've, I've been looking at how we can produce well-characterized uh, bacteriophages. We can manufacture them in well-controlled bioreactors. We can purify them and characterize their impurity profile using a variety of chemical process technologies that are used to produce vaccines and monoclonal antibodies. But bacterial viruses, phages, have not been put through these processes before. So I'm developing the, the critical process parameter knowledge uh, in order to be able to produce these materials. And then I can work with different colleagues that are developing, whether they're developing engineered phages or they're working with wild type phages or synthetic phages. And then they want to evaluate and test these, whether it is for microbiome editing applications or to be used in clinic for uh, human therapy. Um, I'm working with uh, control engineers by uh, looking at how we can use the most advanced online sensing in our processes to monitor 
how uh, we can optimize bacteria uh, 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 infection with phages uh, in order to improve the quality and and the productivity of these systems. Uh, and working with mathematical modeling colleagues, such as my colleague at the University of Stirling in Scotland, we've been looking at developing first principle mathematical models. They help us to not only think about how dose response type uh, targeted delivery applications will work, but to use them in order to develop robust models of how we can manufacture these things in bioreactors, the timing of phage infection, the metabolic growth rates of the host bacteria in which the phage are going to be produced. Uh, so that, you know, that's uh, some disciplines that I, I, I've put across. On the encapsulation side, I've got uh, uh, encapsulation technologies, spray drying, extrusion, the use of microfluidics, by which we can really control the way we produce uh, uh, our encapsulated phages, and they can then be applied in different settings. So we can use them to make very precisely um, micro and nano capsules. They can, working with different uh, uh, polymer chemists, we've been looking at different types of polymers that might have a pH responsive shell. So this is a microfluidic device where we're producing core shell capsules that are a few hundred microns in size. So they can be given in small animal models like mice or rat uh, systems. And because phages don't like uh, encountering organic solvents, we have to think about how we process them. Uh, we can deliver them in a targeted fashion by uh, encapsulating them in different uh, types of polymers. They may respond to virulence factors that might be present at the site of infection. So delivery of high doses, precisely phages at the site of infection is one of the challenges uh, that I've been working on. Uh, with my collaborator at Warwick, she has some really nice um, uh, synthetic phages that are fluorescently labeled, fluorescently labeled bacteria and very nice confocal microscopy. Uh, with my technology, we were able to take a tailed phage. This is a 100 nanometer staph phage. And using microfluidic flow focusing systems, we were able to encapsulate them in little uh, nanoscale liposomes. And then with Antonia, we were able to demonstrate that these phage, phages encapsulate in liposomes can be targeted to macrophages. And she used uh, antibody labeling to try and see during phagocytosis of these liposomes, where will the phage go? And this is sort of a work in progress that, uh, that is ongoing. But again, without collaborating with her, I wouldn't be able to do uh, this work. Uh, with my collaborator at Glasgow, Dan Walker, who is interested in looking at different types of uh, colocins and biocins. He was interested in evaluating whether colocins can be delivered in a mouse model. Uh, and that was the, the, the colocins are very sensitive to pH and enzymatic degradation early in the early part of the gastrointestinal tract of the mouse. So I encapsulated his colocin in these microcapsules we check that these microcapsules at 100 microns in diameter protect the colocins from gastric acidity and enzymatic degradation. And then in a mouse model at the University of Glasgow, we looked at the delivery of the colocin to the colon, to the seeker, uh, and uh, reduction in the counts of E. coli. So again, uh, you know, that's working with colleagues that understand and have well set up animal infection models. Uh, Dan Walker that had expertise in uh, uh, developing the colocin and my expertise on the uh, micro encapsulation side allowed us to do this, this work that we published in Frontiers in Microbiology. And then with the collaborator in uh, uh, Spain, who also came to this workshop that we organized funded by uh, the UKRI EPSRC Bridging the Gap, uh, I encapsulated some salmonella phages using a spray drying process, and I stabilized those phages so that they could go through the GI tract of a chicken 
Uh, and the idea there is that salmonella causes farmers lots of loss because it's a sentinel organism. And if it's found in chickens before they uh, go into the meat, uh, uh, into food, food uh, they are culled and the farmer obviously loses income. So we had to develop a formulation that could be spray dried and it could be incorporated in animal feed. And then we tested it in uh, over a 42 day uh, production cycle of uh, 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 broilers. Uh, and again, that required working with vets, uh, collaborating with a company that manufactures animal feed. And we demonstrated that we were able to uh, uh, deliver phages in a targeted fashion uh, to the seeker in, in poultry. Um, so, I mean, I've just, sort of run through some examples of the sort of work that I'm doing and really echoing what my colleagues have said earlier, that it, it can be very stimulating working across disciplinary boundaries. Uh, and clearly, in order for the partnership to work, you've got to bring something to the table. But I, I feel I've learned and benefited hugely from my collaborations with a variety of different uh, uh, academics from many different disciplines who ordinarily I wouldn't find the corridors of a chemical engineering department um, and I would strongly recommend uh, that uh, you know it, it is moving out of one's comfort zone at times but uh, it's very rewarding and fulfilling thank you thank you for that that's um, great to hear some examples of uh, how transdisciplinary working can be really effective in producing new results. Um, does anybody have any questions for Danish at this stage? If you could just raise your virtual hand, that'd be really helpful. Um, is that you, Phil? Um, Phil Packer, he's got your hand yeah, raised. there's some questions yeah. in the chat, actually. Oh, great, thanks, Phil. A sort oh. of questions might be worth picking up, yeah. Just open the chat, okay. Oh yeah, so. From Chris Lloyd. Oh, Chris, I noticed you've got your hand up. Do you want to ask your question yourself? Yeah, it's just um, I'm not a specialist in this area, but I've got colleagues in the aquaculture industry who are very interested in using phages in terms of commercial fish farming. And they're frustrated that there's no mechanism or recognition through the regulatory authorities currently to get these things licensed for commercial use in veterinary use. So I think the technology is the, we, we're learning more and more about the technology and Danish you just gave this an example of how you can apply it in a poultry situation the industry is frustrated that it can't now go to the next level and commercially um and commercialize these products for use in in a, a real life situation I just wondered if anyone else was having any experiences I see somebody in the chat agreeing with me wonder what your thoughts are because we need to go from a it feels to me as if we need to go from this kind of theoretical research level to okay give us the give us the product we'll use we can use it thank you Spanish, do you have any comments um, in response yeah to i mean i can i can certainly agree i mean there are companies that are very interested in using uh phage products particularly uh, you know in uh, as animal feed additives as just as an example and sometimes i've got to go to places like the us which are much more receptive and open uh for the potential use of phages but certainly in europe you know there there are activities now to try and set up a regulatory framework for the incorporation of phages uh, for use in sort of bio biocontrol and so on. So things are moving forward. Um, there's another question from Pete Jackson. Hi Danish, hasn't the personalized approach currently in clinical development by adaptive phage therapeutics reset the agenda on phage treatment? Yeah, could you repeat that question? I, I'm not sure. sure I understand what the question is. Hasn't the personalized approach currently in clinical development by adaptive phage therapeutics reset the agenda on phage treatment? Yes, and the same thing is happening in Europe. So uh, uh, the magistral potential use of phages in places like Belgium, I mean, you know, the phage is a drug substance uh, produced under a pharmacopoeia guideline can be prescribed by a pharmacist and it's being applied in places like the University of Leuven's phage therapies uh, clinic and in the Queen Astrid Medical Hospital. So 
where all else fails, it can be prescribed uh, and and uh, high quality certificate of analysis pages are available in places like Belgium. So there are different frameworks. There are other clinical trials ongoing that are following the randomized control trial and the GMP manufacturing of phage drug substances that are well cached. So there's different models that you know will finally, obviously, the market will decide what, you know which model sort of works. But uh, there are a variety of different models out there. Thank you. And then there's another question um, from Phil Packer. How and when are you collaborating with industry to develop good manufacturing processes? Or are you only looking to work with personalized medicine in the human sphere? No, we're working with a, a number of uh, phage biotech companies. A lot of the time I do the preclinical development and develop the manufacturing process. And then that's outsourced to GMP manufacturing facilities. For example, there's Jafral in uh, uh, in Europe, there are, you know, there are companies in the in the US, there are companies in Israel, there are companies in Portugal and Spain that have GMP manufacturing sites. But, but GMP manufacturing is so expensive that if you want to do your preclinical development and develop your your process, uh, that's where the companies come to me and I develop their phage drug substances and formulate them and check that they'll be fit for purpose and we can do some preclinical uh, studies there. Um, thank you, Danish. They were really helpful answering those questions there. I just want to thank all the presenters that we've had so far today. So, Will, Claire and Danish, thank you for your presentations. They're really insightful and interesting to hear from you. Um, so on behalf of everyone, thank you. We're going to take a quick break now. So to stick to the agenda that's been shared, just because some people will be popping in and out of this session, if you could all come back by 2.45 and then we'll start the breakout rooms at 2.45. Um, so feel free to stretch your legs, get a coffee, but if you could be back online um, with your cameras on, but microphones off to begin with at 2.45, putting your cameras on just lets me know that everyone is here and we can get going again. So thank you. Any slides you to share? Right, I'm doing that now, then. Yeah. Hopefully you can see see the slides now. Right, I will I will crack on. I can't see your uh, slides yet. Um, you can't. Okay, it's telling me that I am sharing my screen. No, I can't see them either. Okay, I will stop sharing and I will try again. And if it doesn't work that time, maybe if you could email them to me, I can quickly pop them up. Can you see that them now? Uh, no, I can't. I'm seeing a few shaking heads, no. Okay, I'm not sure what the problem is because it's telling me I'm, I'm sharing. Should, do you want to move on to the next talk and I'll email you the slides if that's yeah, okay? Yeah, that would be great, Adam. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah. Julie, do you mind jumping up the schedule and um, doing your talk now? Julie Robotham from not UKHSA. At all. Thank no, you. That's absolutely fine. Let's hope these work. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Brilliant. And is that in full screen mode there? Yes, great. Marvellous. OK, um, I'm going to be looking this way because this is just where the slides are. I realise this is where the camera is, so I'll, I'll come back here every now and again. OK, so it's an absolute pleasure to speak to you all um, on the AMR research uh, from UK Health Security Agency perspective. Uh, so I'm Julie Robotham and I head up the Modelling and Evaluations Unit um, on AMR at UKHSA and I'm also the AMR research lead and the knowledge mobilization lead for AMR as well. Okay, so the um, portfolio of research and development work uh, that is happening at the UK Health Security Agency uh, on AMR is uh, wide ranging. I've tried to summarize in different kind of topic areas 
um, the, the research as a whole. So it tends to fall in these kind of five main categories. So we have research around data science. So this is really thinking about enhancing data collection and particularly data linkage uh, to make best use of the data that we collect and other data sources externally, thinking very much about integrating uh, One Health uh, data and also developing the methods and tools to maximize the use um, of these data that we already have to gain maximal insight from them. Uh, work around transmission. So understanding the mechanisms of transmission, uh, the burden, both in terms of health and economic burden, risk factors for carriage and infection, and really thinking about the clinical outcomes um, of those infections. Transla translational science, so catalyzing the development pathway for uh, novel diagnostics, novel antimicrobials, um, vaccines. Then there's what I've called fundamental science, but these are our kind of laboratory science, basic science um, around characterization of novel resistance mechanisms, um, understanding the links between genotype, phenotype. And then obviously all our, our work is um, aiming to inform policy and evidence making to better public health. Um, so there's large streams of work around interventions and evaluation, really trying to uh, enhance the evidence base, for both design and evaluation of different intervention strategies, including all sorts of infection prevention and control, antimicrobial stewardship um, and other measures. What really comes into this is uh, the behavioral insights type work and health economics work as well for, for different evaluations. So I thought it might be helpful, um, I won't dwell on this, but just to give an, an overview of uh, the division. So this is the division uh, within which much of the AMR work sits. Uh, so it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's the healthcare associated infection, fungal, antimicrobial resistance, antimicrobial usage, and sepsis division. Uh, so it's very multidisciplinary. Um, so we have microbiologists, epidemiologists, clinicians, modelers, um, um, people who work with strategy policy colleagues, um, lots of people working day to day with our surveillance data. Uh, is headed up by Colin Brown and uh, Russell Hope and split into a number of groups. Um, so we have groups for the gram positive, gram negative. Um, this includes the epi and the lab work um, on both sides, as well as the more strategic work for the National Action Plan. Uh, antimicrobial resistance and prescribing group, really trying to understand that surveillance data in terms of both resistance and prescribing trends. Primary care and interventions unit, uh, lots of work around development of guidance, education, strategies, and public engagement. I head up the modeling and evaluations unit, and we do most of the modeling and economic analysis. Then there's the genomics group, uh, data management, which is very keen, a uh, key to kind of cross divisional function. And then we have a group looking at uh, infection prevention and control and outbreaks. So really that rapid detection um, uh, and uh, outbreak investigation type work uh, alongside antimicrobial stewardship. So big public awareness campaigns and things like that would sit within antimicrobial stewardship. Um, key to all of this is data. So we collect and uh, hold all sorts of different surveillance data sets. This just gives a kind of snapshot of some of them. So we have our microbiology data, um, reference data sets, um, mandatory surveillance data from across um, NHS uh, trusts for key drug bug combinations, surgical site infection data, I won't list them all, but we're really working hard to kind of uh, maximize use of these, as I've already said, and work towards kind of data linkage um, with other data sets that we may not collect. So things like um, uh, around deaths or ethnicity, deprivation, and with uh, data like hospital episode statistics that looks at patient movements in and out of all of the NHS hospitals across the country. Um, so we, we collect and hold all sorts of rich data and it, it really is an asset. Um, just to focus in for a second on the genomics work. Um, so it's a priority at the moment 
to really kind of push forward um, our genomics um, capacity and capability through implementation of bioinformatic pipelines, um, really trying to make use of large scale routine uh, whole genome sequence data, lots of work around comparative genomics um, to um, think about outbreaks and outbreak investigation. Uh, prediction of antimicrobial resistance phenotypes from uh, geno genome sequence data and uh, using uh, bioinformatics and genomic investigation for the uh, understanding the implication of novel mechanisms of uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance. We also have a group of uh, researchers at UKHSA Porton Down. Uh, I'd say uh, there it's more on the kind of innovation um, uh, development end of the research and development spectrum, um, but not all. Um, so this is uh, chaired by Joanna Bacon. So please do get in touch if uh, more information would be helpful. Um, so they do all sorts of work around kind of development of vaccines, for example, antigen discovery and diagnostics, antimicrobial susceptibility testing, development work, developing alternatives to antibiotics, uh, bacteriophage work, post-directed therapy, all sorts of exciting things, um, and especially around novel technologies. So really kind of pushing things forward. We have um, a, a mock uh, hospital ward set up uh, at Porton Down, which is used for lots of um, research projects to understand the transmission and potential um, IPC measures in the built environment. Um, also uh, work around in vivo models. So as I mentioned before, the majority of our work, if not all, is um, informing uh, policy decisions um, and work towards the, the National Action Plan. Um, as I'm sure you're all very well aware, the government committed to this series of five-year national action plans to support the 20-year vision. Um, and uh, within our current uh, five-year national action plan, we're working towards a number of ambitions uh, around reducing the need for antimicrobials, optimizing their use and investing in innovation, supply and access. And we're very much involved in helping develop uh, the next action plan, which will kick off next year. So this is just an overview of our research um, publications. So peer reviewed publications um, from April 21 to 22. Um, in AMR and how they're distributed across the human health themes within that national action plan. So you can see that we do work across the broad range of, of NAP themes, um, but much of it is around stronger laboratory capacity and surveillance in humans and uh, optimizing use of antimicrobials. Although there's a fair amount of kind of basic research and um, infection prevention of control research as well. I just wanted to quickly highlight the health protection research units. So these are NIHR uh, funded um, uh, projects lasting five years and uh, two of them were funded in the area of AMR um, running from 2020 to 2025, building on previous ones before that. And um, they cover a broad uh, re a, a range of research areas. So our HPRU uh, with Imperial College London um, is uh, directed by Alison Holmes and Colin Brown at UKHSA and covers four main research themes, which I'll just highlight here. I will share these slides, by the way, if anyone is interested. And then we have our HPRU with Oxford University, uh, directed by Sarah Walker at Oxford and Susan Hopkins at UKHSA, again, covering a, a four research themes, covering all sorts of different um, research areas. And this really has built up a large infrastructure and is uh, creating a lot of research output impacting patient uh, and public health. In the development of the new National Action Plan, we've been thinking a lot about our kind of forward research priorities at UKHSA, and it falls into these kind of uh, seven main themes around the development of antimicrobials and therapeutics, diagnostics, um, burden drivers and epidemiology, uh, IPC, optimization of antimicrobial use, pathogen characterization and vaccines. 
all of these being completely multidisciplinary and uh, cutting across them all is this idea of trying to optimize the use of data. So really thinking about sharing data, access to it and development of both methods and tools uh, to optimize the use to help with things like clinical decision making and intervention evaluation and outbreak detection. There are a number of key populations that we're really thinking about. Um, children and neonates in particular, we think should be a focus area. Um, the community, lots is done within hospitals, but we really don't understand the, the burden and reservoir in the community well enough. And thinking about the whole patient pathway and the care pathway from community through primary and through to secondary care. Understanding the built environment and also thinking about health inequality, so really understanding factors like deprivation. And finally, just some uh, further key thoughts. We're really thinking very much about knowledge mobilization. So connecting those research-based activities and all of that research um, and its outputs um, with those who um, can influence decisions or, or kind of public policy and professional practice. Uh, we're very much thinking about One Health, so integrating surveillance data across and then uh, really thinking about how we can join up that research. So very keen on that. Um, health economics is something we really need to build on and continue to, to have economic arguments supporting those decisions. Behavioral insights and implementation science this is key. Uh, what we're trying to do is um, influence uh, change and much of that hinges on those behavioral insights and implementation. And finally, evaluation, um, any change that we are um, influencing, we need to be able to really think about what the metrics are that we're evaluating that against both in the immediate and long term, incredibly important for AMR to continue to think about the longer term too. And key to all of this is that data. Um, so that really is our focus and optimizing the use of the data that is available. And I will stop talking. Sorry if I went slightly over. Thank you. Any questions, please feel free to um, email me after as well. And as I said, I will share the slides. Let me see if I can stop sharing. Thank you, Jeannie. That's great. Really helpful information. Um, we were running a bit close for time on that one, so I will push off questions for the end. But also, if you've got any questions for Julie, maybe if you could pop them in the chat, that would be really helpful. Um, so I've got Adam's slides now, so we'll move on. We'll move back to Adam from DSTL. So if I share your slides, Adam, and then you can just tell me. I, uh, can I just try one more time, just in case yeah, of um, it ought to. Is that showing? Are you seeing anything? Not yet. OK. Um, oh, no, it's just popped up for me. It might be my right, internet's a bit slow. Okay, well, I think all mine very slow. Okay, I'll crack on. This probably shouldn't take too long, so hopefully I can make up a bit of time. Um, if there's any problem with my slides and they're not progressing, just please let me know. So um, good afternoon, hello everyone, um, and thank you for the organizers for allowing me some time to give you an overview of our particular interest in um, AMR. So I'm, I'm Adam Whelan, I'm a, a research microbiologist at the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory, um, DSTL. And um, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to who DSTL are um, and why, from a defence perspective, why we're interested in AMR. And rather than some of the research we do, because we don't tend to specifically look at AMR directly, but it tends to be um, indirectly, we have an interest in it. And I'll give an overview of some of the capabilities of um, the microbiology area in DSDL since that might be of interest from a network perspective. So as an organization, uh, DSDL's remit is primarily to provide um, science and technology, both advice and solutions for UK defence and security. Um, our site is based at the um, at Port and Down over, over the fence from UKHSA and near Salisbury. We have approximately 5,000 staff and our annual turnover is nearly um, 900 million. But just to caveat that, that's not all focused on AMR, that's across the um, defence research area. So we provide a number of roles. We provide operational support, um, a lot of specialist advice, 
um, and also um, evaluation, um, looking at requirements, but nearly 50% of our, our budget and our income is in basic research. Um, primarily that's for and funded by the MOD, um, but also we work a lot um, considerably with the Home Office and, to a lesser extent, many of the other um, government agencies, um, um, government departments, and we are a government agency. So um, defence science is very broad. Um, it includes many different um, strategic capabilities, um, anything from um, we have AI, cybersecurity, high performance and um, computers, a lot of platform technologies and a platform technology is basically anything that is um, attached to a platform and that could be a ship, a plane or a tank. Um, but for relevance to our AMR interest, that sits within um, our division CBR, which is chemical, biological and radiological, which I'll talk about a bit more about what we do and why. So within the CBR division, which is where I sit, we have a number of roles. Um, again, I've mentioned before, we do provide a lot of advice and supporting operations, but key to this is understanding um, future, well, current and future threats. And I'll highlight some of the areas which um, are perhaps not unique to defense, but are a higher priority. Um, and one example um, is in terms of anticip anticipating threats, we have to be mindful that someone may deliberately re-engineer um, a microorganism um, to make it more pathogenic or more resistant. So that's something that you know we have to factor in, which is obviously relevant to AMR. Um, but the key area for us um, and where it links to our AMR interests is um, this concept of improving medical outcomes. And this is in the event of a, a deliberate or accidental or environmental um, exposure to an infectious organism. So and this really brings us on to why you know, we have an interest in AMR for defense. And it's really about um, making sure we've got the necessary tools required um, to treat any individuals exposed to these potential pathogens. And infections can arise from a number of reasons. It may be deliberate release of a biowarfare microbiological agent, um, but it can also be exposure to uh, military personnel that are operating in um, particular environments where these pathogens are endemic. Um, an example might be, I mean, recently, when um, service personnel were deployed to Afghanistan, a lot of ser pers service personnel were being exposed to Coxiella bonetii that causes Q fever. And in some cases that can have um, li lifelong um, consequences. Um, but the other important area for us is infections associated with traumatic wound injuries. I mean, this last point is we're not really doing any active research at the moment, but it's certainly something we are mindful of. And we're interested to see how the uh, field is developing. So I'll talk a little bit about our particular um, capabilities within um, the microbiology group at um, the SDL Porton Down, and this is the, uh, the group that I sit in. And our particular specialism is our ability to handle um, pathogens at high containment. So we have extensive laboratory facilities for handling materials at level two, three, and up to four for our viral pathogens. Um, and this includes... Um, also being able to um, have animal infection models. And um, we have extensive um, experience and interest in aerosol infection, but also I'll touch on later, um, interest in, in um, delivery of therapeutics by the um, aerosol route. The, an area where, again, it's a little bit more niche for um, defense is the nature of the disease and the pathogens we're interested in. So I've identified the more commonly um, sort of biothreat uh, bacterial pathogens, um, many of which you'll recognize, but they all have common features. Uh, that there's mainly zoonotics. They, are, um, they require containment level three um, handling, but they can result in acute lethal or incapacitating infections, but perhaps particularly importantly, they can cause infection by the inhalational route, which is the primary route of infection of concern um, to biodefense, and they all cause um, pulmonary infections. And there's also tr limited treatment options. They're all relatively difficult to treat, 
Um, with the exception of Bacillus anthracis, they're gram negatives. Um, they all have an intracellular um, life cycle. Um, and there tends to be, rather than um, acquired resistance through use or misuse, perhaps, um, they tend to be inherently resistant to many antibiotics. An example would be um, particularly the Burkhardieri species that um, have multiple efflux pumps and um, beta lactamases encoded into the genome. So we know these are difficult to treat. So where um, we have a, a program of work um, which links to the development of novel um, antimicrobials for AMR is assessing um, these therapeutics for use in um, against these particular um, pathogens. So we do have research looking at um, target discovery, but we're not drug developers per se, but we work extensively with industry um, and academia um, to really identify what's coming through the field or perhaps to repurpose um, commercial off the shelf uh, compounds where we can screen them in our in vitro models and then transition them um, to our in vivo models. Um, in mice, and we also have a non-human primate model that we can work with in containment, um, the Marmoset, but ultimately to see if we can um, help provide that body of data to, to move some of those um, therapeutics through a clinical pathway um, to see if they could be licensed or used for a biodefense clinical um, indication. Um, but really, we're, we're very interested in strategies that can improve, um, enhance the efficacy or perhaps the stability um, of uh, therapeutics, whether they're the ones under clinical development or um, already licensed for um, clinical indications. But you know, something that's particularly um, important for the military is operational burden. So um, in that context, um, we want something that's easy to deploy. Um, so ideally, um, a tablet that could be taken orally or perhaps um, inhaled because the, the, the best novel therapeutics coming through the pipelines, if they're only um, suitable for IV infusion, that, that's quite complex um, in, a, in a military context. And we're looking at um, and working with others, um, looking at a number of different strategies to sort of improve some of those properties. Um, for example, and I'll, I'll mention it briefly, um, looking at encapsulation methodologies and also combination therapies, and that might be combining antibiotics with vaccines, other antibiotics or host directed uh, therapies. Um, within the pr our program of work, we're also interested in post exposure and um, prophylaxis and vaccines, um, but that would be for a different talk. So I mentioned uh, we have an, an interesting capability in um, inhaled therapeutics. Um, the pathogens we're interested in can all cause pulmonary infections. Um, and so it seems logical that if we deliver the therapeutic by the inhaled route, we can achieve higher concentrations in the lung um, with reduced um, off-target um, toxicity. Um, and also has the potential to be um, self-administered and certainly um, relatively easily deployable with some of the, the formulations. And we do have um, capabilities to um, deliver um, both pathogen and drugs um, to, in our um, animal models in our containment facilities. And we have done that um, in both mice and um, marmosets. And the other um, technology area um, which I'm going to touch him on, which is actually my, my last slide, is thinking about drug reformulation. Um, and this might be to improve the pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics of a particular drug. Um, and that links to thinking about you know, alternative delivery routes, um, particularly a focus on oral and inhaled for reducing the logistic burden of how you might use them. A um, little bit of a specialism in, um, or, or particular interest in palatability, but that, that does link specifically to um, how we might assess them in our non-human primate models. Um, but we're already working with others um, at um, looking at encapsulation technologies, for example, looking at um, polymer-based encapsulation with researchers at the University of Southampton and also um, non-ionic surfactant vesicle type approaches um, with um, University of Strathclyde. And that also links to um, 
using nanoparticle type technologies to see if you can um, deliver drugs to, across the blood brain barrier, for example. Um, so that was my last slide. Thank you for your attention. Happy to take um, any questions if there's time. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, does anybody have any questions for Adam at this moment? If you could just raise your hand, that would be very helpful. Um, if not, then we'll move on to the next um, stakeholder talk. Um, so thank you again, Adam. Really interesting talk. Really great to hear from a different uh, end user of AMR research. Uh, research. Um, so next, we've got Tim Miles from GSK. Uh, Tim, if you want to start sharing your screen. Can you see my uh, my slides now? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Fantastic. Sorry about that. It, I, I had it all organised and then it disappeared. Right. Excellent. My name is uh, Tim Mars, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I actually reside in Tres Cantos in the Global Health uh, Unit within uh, GSK, and I'm just going to give you a whistle-stop tour of uh, GSK's interest uh, and uh, the Global Health Unit here in Tres Cantos specifically. So um, in Global Health, we're specifically committed to uh, reduce uh, and uh, reduce the, uh, the burden of high infectious diseases, particularly in medium and low income countries. That's our main focus. And we do that through a three pronged approach. We have a pillar with respect to R&D. We have a pillar with respect to access. And then we have a pillar with respect to capability uh, building. And within the whole team, there's about uh, 200 uh, people that work within the global health unit within um, within within GSK and we have sites in um, Tres Cantos, also in Italy, as well as Belgium and uh, the UK, with some members also uh, residing in the US. But I'm really going to focus on the area where I work in, which is specifically I work in R&D and specifically I work within the medicine uh, unit uh, and uh, within within that. And so we reside uh, in Tres Cantos, as I, co as I commented, uh, we have some um, footprint in the UK for our clinical uh, aspects, but most of the uh, people reside in Tres Cantos. And as our focus has really been on TB, malaria and uh, NTDs, but now we're starting to get interested in uh, and getting into AMR. And that's an area that's been sort of been building over the last couple of years. And I lead that portfolio from a global health uh, perspective. And the way that we operate is specifically we operate uh, here in Global Health, specifically in a collaborative model. So everything we do is in collaboration and we have collaborations both from an academic perspective, but we also have uh, collaborations with uh, NGOs as well as downstream um, uh, partners that are able to then uh, to um, manufacture and then continue uh, to move our assets forward. Clearly we have a a sustainable model. There's not every, we can't do everything on our own, uh, so therefore we have to work in partnerships to be able to deliver those treatment options to uh, patients. And typically, uh, we would we we would typically look to uh, transition leadership, particularly as we go through uh, development. There will be special cases where we might continue to develop and to be the the sponsor of that asset, but the but the, the majority of the work that we will do specifically will be in. Uh, as a, as a, in a partnership model, as, I, as I've explained. And everything we do is trying to maximize our impact to patients as quickly as possible. So in the Tres Cantos unit here, we are split into uh, several different uh, teams. Um, we have teams who are, are, are focused on the clinical aspects. We have uh, biology platforms, as was commented by the previous uh, commentator, uh, around that we have availability up to BSL-3. Actually, 
we're looking to increase that and that's something that's being looked into to go to, B, to BSL-4. So we're able to look at uh, different pathogens, uh, et cetera. But the main piece here really is to highlight the external collaborators. This is a big part of what we do and everything we do as I said, we do everything in collaborations, uh, both uh, within consortiums as well as one-on-one -on -one collaborations with individual academics. And depending on the disease area, depending on uh, depending on what the network looks like, we'll have slightly different models depending on um, on how they the, how we how we interact and what the area looks like. And so one area in which we we do that, or, or one sort of vehicle we do that in, I should let's say, is something called the Open Lab. So this is something that has been running for the last, well, I guess, about twelve years now, um, and it's an independent uh, piece to to GSK. But this is a, a vehicle that allows uh, academics to apply for funding that um, is independent to GSK and they can then look to get a one to two year grant. Um, and specifically the way this works is that the, um, if successful, then the scientists then co-locate both in the laboratories of the PI, but also with here in Transcanto so they get some industrial experience. And a clear, a clear thing, distinguishing feature here is that of course we work in a global health that all the intellectual property is then guided by WIPO research uh, principles. And, and of course, it has to align with GSK's interests, so whether that be in AMR, TB, malaria, or NTDs. And we look to basically uh, uh, fund those uh, projects, as I said, uh, through that interaction. And that then allows us to then build relationships with academics, but also importantly, to seek out new innovative uh, science out there and to see if we can then industrialize that and then turn that eventually into a, a medicine. And I guess I wanted to put one slide particularly around uh, AMR and where we, we really are interested in. So from an AMR perspective, as I said, we, I'm interested in the low income middle country space. That clearly is an area that needs, uh, it's clearly undeveloped at this point in time. And when you look through the many reports out there, um, which I guess most of you are, are aware of, but specifically, I think when you look at the WHO report, which was published in 2019, many of the, there was only six out of the 52 uh, preclinical assets were considered additive by their uh, classification and of course many of those if you look at those they're not really been uh, focused for low income middle country um, areas so that's really where my remit is uh, looking for and I think so through a lot of actually the breakout room sessions that I've been involved with today uh, actually have touched on some of the areas that we're interested in in the sense that we're interested in actually thinking about answering the real key NMR, AMR questions and we believe that that would allow us to deliver disruptive platforms that will overcome resistance and uh, drug burden and so areas that we're kind of interested in is, is um, at the moment we're interested in, in replicative uh, so thinking about persistence or tolerance um, we're also thinking about biofilms and encapsulations again that's been touched on today um, you know and think we're also thinking about looking learning from mother nature particularly from bacteriophages how do they are able to come some of those challenges I think it's quite an interesting uh, field for us to be considering and then uh, host interactions as well um, you know I think that's an area that's super interesting of course these are not these are just a couple of areas that we're interested in but of course we're open to uh, listen to other areas if anyone else has wants areas of collaboration with us on those particular point but ultimately what we're thinking about is building these platforms uh, such that they can be used in tr in combination with traditional approaches that then have the potential to overcome or change the AMR treatment paradigm that we currently uh, see ourselves and as I, I'd like to reiterate again you know having disciplinary uh, collaborations is absolutely critical uh, to be finding innovative solutions to get ahead of AMR and that is something that we are uh, very keen to continue our collaborational model that we've developed over the number of years here in uh, global health and that is me in a nutshell. Great, that's, that's great Tim, thank you for sharing. Um, those slides. Um, does anybody have any questions for Tim at this point? Um, please just pop your virtual hand up if you do. If not, then we'll move on to the final presentation um, for this workshop. So that's John Redshaw from SEPA. So John, if you want to start sharing your slides um, and then we can get going. Yep, just bear with me a moment. Thank you.
Shall be a moment. No problem. Can you see them here? I can't see any slides yet. Do you have a, a copy of my slides? I think I sent them earlier, didn't I? Yeah, I can. Um, that might be best actually, just to, uh, if you can project them from your end. Of course. Okay, I'll just share my screen. Thank you. Th thank you very much. That's great. Hopefully everyone can see them. OK, there's really quite a broad mix of folk here today, aren't there? Different organisations, individuals, backgrounds, and so on and so forth. And uh, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for this opportunity to present an environmental regulator's perspective on AMR this afternoon and uh, I've worked on environmental regulation in Scotland for the last 38 years and have a background in uh, ecotoxicology and chemical risk assessment and uh, have worked increasingly on environment and health issues and AMR for the last 10 years or so. I should caveat this presentation by saying that the views expressed are my own and not necessarily those of my employer, uh, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, because this is such a, an, an emerging issue for us. So uh, next slide, please. So a few words about SEPA. SEPA is Scotland's principal environmental regulator with a statutory purpose to protect and improve the environment and to do so in ways where possible that also create health and well-being benefits and sustainable economic growth. And we do this through our core services of regulation and flood risk management. And much of the work that SEPA does is also relevant to protecting people from the adverse effects of environmental exposure, whether that is in relation to flooding or air, water and land quality. It does this in part by monitoring and reporting on the state of Scotland's environment and by ensuring that regulated emissions comply with environmental quality standards set to protect ecosystems and human health. And uh, SEPA doesn't have a specific remit or budget to work on antimicrobial resistance, and yet it does recognize the importance of this global challenge. And so for the last five years or so, it has been addressing the issue in a pragmatic, low cost way, for example, by testing routine bathing water samples for ESBL coli and vancomycin resistance enterococci and also by considering AMR in its established work on the monitoring and assessment and regulation of hazardous chemicals in the environment. So for example, in relation to work we do on pharmaceutical pollution. SEPA also contributes through Scottish and UK wide groups to Scotland's delivery of work for the National AMR Action Plan. And we've heard about that already. Next slide, please. And looking specifically at the environmental component, of AMR from a regulatory point of view. The existing AMR action plan has four broad policy commitments. One is very much around research to improve understanding of hazards and risks. Another one is about gathering evidence on risks to inform policy and to raise public awareness. I think we've had elements of social science coming in this afternoon, haven't we? And we do recognize that we all have a role to play as we do in climate change and other global challenges uh, in responding to this crisis. The third area is to maintain legislation to control releases of harmful substances to aquatic environments, which might otherwise contribute to the spread of AMR. So that's uh, coming through, for example, through the Water Framework Directive. Um, we are seeing macrolide antibiotics there, and we're seeing some consideration of the azole-based uh, fungicides. And fourthly, to establish a river catchment-based approach to AMR surveillance 
to inform policy and interventions. And I think a number of you are familiar with the PathSafe Workstream 4 that's addressing that issue. With this action plan, it's fair to say that the focus, at least on the environmental aspect of AMR, is very much about antibiotic resistance in the water environment. And yet we do realize the wider um, uh, in, in, um, importance of this uh, issue. Next slide, please. And indeed, I just wanted to touch upon this one at the moment. Um, I, I've uh, been feeding into the process that is developing the new national AMR action plan in the UK. And there are a number of outcomes that are uh, being developed at the moment. And this one here seems particularly pertinent for us as an environmental regulator to consider. You can read it um, as well as I can, but in essence, uh, by 2029, that's the end of the next five year period, the UK will have improved capability to measure, predict, understand and mitigate the transmission of resistant microorganisms and antimicrobial molecules locally and nationally across human, animals, agriculture and environmental sectors. So very much one health uh, at the focus and very much one about understanding, monitoring, modelling and mitigating uh, the uh, effects of environmental drivers on AMR. So what are the implications of this outcome for AMR in the environment and for future environmental policy and regulation? And if we can move on, please. There are many sectors and activities that CEPA regulates that have the potential to affect the spread of AMR through the environment. And these include emissions of AMR genes, microbes and chemicals to air, land and water environments. And there are some fundamental questions that we need to address in responding to this. Next slide, please. So recognizing that uh, we're still quite at an early stage relative to a number of the people here this afternoon. But in terms of Scotland's main environmental regulator, these are the kind of questions that have come to my mind. So what role should the environmental regulator like CEPA play in the AMR agenda? Should we consider AMR in the environment as a form of pollution or a consequence of pollution? I think it's fair to say that it's um, greater, isn't it, um, in more polluted environments, but is AMR in itself, genes, microbes, pathogens, uh, chemicals, do they constitute a pollution? And if so, what determinants should we be most concerned about? Are we concerned about AMR solely from a human and animal health viewpoint? Or are, are we also concerned about impacts on the integrity, structure and functioning of ecosystems? Okay, making sure we're very clear about the focus of the AMR action plan. Is it primarily about animal health or, or human health? Hu human health is, is the impression I get. Should we aim to set environmental criteria to assess and regulate substances for example, in the way that we do for hazardous chemicals. So um, which sectors and regulated activities present the greatest risk in exacerbating the spread of AMR in the environment? There's a lot of focus on wastewater discharges to rivers and combined sewer overflows. We're also conscious that uh, biosolids and various organic materials are applied to land as part of the circular economy to, to help in agriculture. And there are other routes through which uh, AMR um, agents are being released to the environment. So is some form of regulation required? And if so, what types and levels of intervention are required to contain and control um, AMR emissions to the environment and the spread of AMR uh, through the environment? Those are, those are, key, those are, key, those are key issues. Uh, we can think here of um, advanced wastewater treatment. Uh, we can think about uh, the treatment of sludges and other organic materials before they're being applied to land, possibly integrated constructed wetlands uh, for the management of farm waste arisings. Next slide, please. And this is indeed my final slide, and these are just some requirements that have come to mind. Uh, the first one of which is to reframe how we address the environmental dimension of AMR. And I think Will Gaze touched upon this um, with reference to work that him and Joachim Larson and Ed Top have been doing. There has been a tendency in the past, it's fair to say, I think, that uh, whilst we talk about One Health, uh, we don't actually yet um, 
work uh, fully in a, a One Health mindset. Um, there needs to be most, much more crossover, I think, uh, and also not just looking at environmental AMR as um, a, a bolt on or a bit on the side, if you like to use that expression, but rather uh, integral to the uh, development and exacerbation of antimicrobial resistance in its broadest sense uh, in, in the clinic. The second point I've jotted down here is an online resource, a register of AMR research and key findings. There is so much work going on in this field, it's very difficult to keep in touch with it. So having access to an online uh, register so we can see what work has been done would be invaluable, I think. I think also building on that, we need focused, timely, tailored messages to inform environmental AMR surveillance, uh, policy and legislation. And I'm sure everyone is familiar with the work of the Intergovernment Panel on climate change and the way in which they produce um, recommendations for policymakers. It's very important that the science works its way through and is integral to the future development of policy and regulation. Another area is that around harmonization of test methods and the whole issue about quality assurance and control in the test methods, the reproducibility and repeatability of them. And to have a shared accessible online platform for surveillance and reporting. So we talk about One Health integrated surveillance. And even if we just think about the UK for the moment, uh, what does that look like? Uh, how are the data generated? Where are the data held? What level of quality assurance do we have over them? Um, and so on and so forth. We need to also identify and address regional and local priorities as well as national ones. And in Scotland, I give reference here to vancomycin resistance in enterococci is much higher in Scotland than it is in England. Indeed, in Scotland, it's the second highest in Europe. And so it is a big concern and we're not sure why. And so we have in place a very early stage um, One Health program on that. Um, ne next one is to develop and evaluate cost benefits of potential technologies for the treatment of emissions to the environment. So whether that is wastewater to river, whether that is um, biosolids or organic manures to land, or whether it's emissions from um, intensive poultry units to explore the uh, development of technologies for pollution abatement. And, and finally, to develop and implement a biobank of genomic material in Scotland and indeed across the UK to inform and support future questions regarding zoonotic diseases, human pathogens and AMR. So for example, here, we've been monitoring our bathing waters for many years and we have, um, we have about, about 10 years worth of material uh, from bathing waters that is, uh, is frozen and would be available for people to test if they wish to do so. So I think those are the sort of uh, points that I want to get across this afternoon. As I say, it's quite early days for SEPA as an organization to be involved in this agenda. Uh, we're very conscious, I'm sure, of the triple planetary crises of um, climate change, biodiversity loss, and environmental pollution. And I think we need to be thinking about the way in which AMR can be considered in the context of other planetary crises like this, and to see to what extent we can pursue actions to address AMR in the environment through existing uh, well-established uh, programs of work. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, great to hear from you. Does anybody have any questions for John or the other speakers from this stakeholder session? Um, pop your hand up if you do. Claire? Yeah, I guess I'm, um, I love those presentations. Thank you so much. Um, I guess I'm just wondering, um, thinking right from Julie's one where she put up the slide with, you know, the future priorities, whether there is a need or whether they would find it useful from, you know, the different agencies for there to be one of the networks that is focused on helping with prioritization, you know, what research needs to be prioritized in order to inform action on AMR from their perspective um, and whether it might be useful to have one of those first initial networks to help 
to prioritise and work closely with them in prioritising which kind of research is needed to go forward with that second round. And I'm just wondering whether Julie or any of the others might um, consider it useful for this community to, you know, the research community to kind of come behind them and help with prioritising which bits of research the community should be putting forward um, in order to deal with AMR for the next few decades. Um, Julie, are you able to comment on that? Yeah, I don't seem to be able to start my video again. Apologies. Um, uh, but yes, I think that would be very useful. There's lots of discussion around, I hate the term, but it does get it across, bang for buck. So where should the interventions be kind of applied? What would help achieve those national action plan ambitions to the greatest degree? What would have most impact on health? What would have most impact in terms of the economic aspects? And, you know, how should uh, our finite resource in terms of kind of public health spend, how could that best be spent to you know, public health benefit, I suppose. So prioritization around uh, intervention and strategy planning, I think would be very helpful, yes. Could that, Diane, Danielle, could that be a network on that topic? Because I feel like the other networks are quite narrowly defined on particular domains, but this might, you know, help to pull some of the other ones together. I think there's a piece here around the different networks convening together once they're established and doing this piece across the whole of them. Um, I think we would expect all of the networks to both talk with each other and continue to talk and feed information into UKRI. And UKRI is in also involved in things like the National Action Plan for AMR. And we do feed the feedback we get from our communities up through the um, ladder into government priorities. So yeah, having these networks is another source of information we can rely on for that sort of um, priority prioritisation work both for UKRI and for other government stakeholders. But there is quite a lot more work to prioritisation than simply people getting together. You could have a whole network that is about the um, work. Martha? Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, John about um, the, the last um, one of the last points you made is, is, is looking at ways to reduce um, the environmental contamination. And you said something about whether that's poultry or, or, or other forms. So are you looking, are you interested in sort of how that interfaces with AMR in, in that those types of contamination are implicit within that? Or I was just wondering what you meant by that. Well, well certainly one of the things that's well established in the environment area is that of the water framework directive and the way in which we can characterize pressures. We can then uh, monitor and assess the state of the environment we can then uh, develop interventions, programs of measures, and reevaluate the uh, effectiveness of those measures in delivering, based on a classification scheme, our objectives for environmental management. So that's the familiar dips here cycle that maybe uh, many folk are, are, are used to thinking about. I, I think uh, this issue, from an environmental regulator's perspective, I think this issue is at, at a more fundamental stage. I think there's an increasing recognition that the environment has an important role to play in the um, selection, dissemination, and transmission of clinically important AMR. In terms of understanding though, and reading across uh, from human to animal to food and environment, what are the things that we should be concerned about? What are the pathogens we're concerned about in the environment? What are the genes and the chemicals that we should be concerned about? And how do we, if we're gonna start putting in place surveillance, how do we assess the data that we generate? What do they mean? Do they constitute environmental harm? Do we even need to start to put in place or think about some form of regulation to address these pressures? Or is the understanding at the moment uh, not enough to allow us to push for that? Part of me says that under the precautionary principle, perhaps we need to, we, we know enough to be starting to at least talk about this, um, uh, even though we don't have legislation and standards for it yet. Yeah. I've been quite encouraged recently by some recommendations that have come out from the European Commission, which is about developing a, a more of a health approach and made reference to the environment on many occasions. So I think that there is a growing awareness of this. 
but in terms of interventions, okay. is it too early? Is it too early? Part of it is to developing uh, discussions with the sectors and at least making sure that we're on the same page. Um, we might be able to bring about um, effect control through established mechanisms. So if we manage to reduce combined sewer overflows into rivers, then um, which is part of our program, then um, we may well expect to reduce the AMR risk on those rivers. But our understanding, I think, is uh, not sufficiently robust to allow us to develop criteria, I don't think, at the moment. But it comes back to what I said about there being a wealth of research out there. And what we do need to do is to make sure that it's translated into a language and in a way that is relevant for policymakers and regulators doing the day-to-day -day work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Roberto? Sorry, just a couple of points. Um, first one, um, really thinking about prioritisation, different um, overarching networks. Certainly some of the um, big EU projects are looking at that from a perspective of how do you bring all of the different priorities within um, networks together and particularly with simulation exercises and, and thinking about how those interventions could actually be used. So there's probably merit in thinking about that network across those different areas. Um, and also uh, thinking about how the, the outputs, whether it's welfare, if, if we're talking about animals um, or their health as well, should be um, priorities. To, to John's point, uh, really, really great about the environment. And um, just, um, I suppose, just highlighting that, thinking about antimicrobial use in, in plants and that many of those plants end up being feed for our livestock and, and looking at that part of the chain of how um, we see AMR transmitted. Uh, would be interested as well, I think. Yes, just a, just a quick comment on that, to Roberto. Um, certainly, the azole fungicides do feature in the water framework directive oh. uh, list, watch list substances. Uh, we are looking at them. We're not. We're not. Um, it's probably fair to say at the moment, whilst people are aware that there are a wide diversity of chemicals that are implicated in exacerbating AMR. We haven't yet started setting in earnest environmental criteria for those chemicals. We have seen various researchers and indeed the AMR Industry Alliance has set discharge limits for antibiotics, but we haven't uh, yet seen in mainstream legislation these things taking root. But it would, I think, only a matter of time. There, mm -hmm. there has been, I think, um, some feeling in, in certain quarters that the existing ecotoxicity uh, cri based criteria will be sufficiently uh, uh, would be sufficient to protect against AMR risk. I'm not sure how robust the science is um, to demonstrate that, mm -hmm. but it illustrates part of the uh, discussion that is being had. Yeah, we definitely need to know more. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think we've got time for just one more question. So Manakshi, do you want to go ahead? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I see that what I want to ask is already being uh, discussed in the chat, which is about the... Uh, uh, how to bring in um, issues um, about LMICs. Um, it was very interesting in the presentations to see the contrast uh, between the UK focus and Tim Miles in his presentation brought out the LMIC issues very nicely. Um, I'm, 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 I'm really curious to understand to what extent the organizers, the funders see a distinction uh, between LMICs and UK, given that this is a cross-border issue. Um, we, uh, you know, our experience of COVID has shown that, that it is really important to have that kind of uh, a planetary, um, a whole systems approach to AMR. So what, how is that thinking going to be reflected in that, in this call? Over. Sure. So I can uh, try and work to answer that. So I think, in, if we go back to what Jeff was saying earlier when he highlighted there's certain international calls that are being run separately in parallel because of the limits of working internationally, that just comes down to obviously if we're working with an international par partner such as China, we have to be we're quite limited on the scope because every, each country has to agree. So then in separately, we're doing this UKRI call so that we can be a bit more free with the scope and make sure it fully addresses our strategy around AMR. So that's why there's like separate international calls and then this call. That's not to say that we're not looking for international aspects within these networks. Um, 
obviously we've as we've highlighted the whole AMR scope is within remit um, just within the first phase international researchers as co eyes on the initial founding members of the grant aren't included um, but we haven't made a decision on the second phase yet in terms of the research grants whether they'll be included um, and we still are looking for there to be international members as part of these networks when they are established so i think there's many ways to bring in that international aspect and it's something we're very aware of and i i agree that it is a very important part of tackling AMR, it needs to have that global aspect. So we're not saying we're not looking for international um, research within this call. It's just being addressed in parallel in different ways in addition to what we're doing here. I hope that makes sense. Yes, thanks. OK, so um, I think we'll move on to closing the meeting. So I just want to thank you all very much for attending today and taking part. I just want to highlight again the offline networking and coalescing part of this workshop. So obviously being a virtual workshop, we've had to run it a bit differently to the in-person ones. So a lot of the onus is now on you in terms of offline networking. You've made some initial connections today, hopefully in your breakout groups. And I'm really hoping you make the most out of that Excel spreadsheet that was circulated um, when you registered for the um, workshops to make the most of that spreadsheet to create new connections and diverse partnerships and form new network ideas based off the initial discussions you've had here today and also discussions that might take place offline following this workshop um, ahead of the call cool launch in September. So really just want to drill that <laughs> into you. Please make the most out of that spreadsheet. Contact people offline, pitch ideas to them and maybe come together and create new ideas ahead of September's launch date. Um, yeah, and if you have any questions, as I said earlier, um, email the UKRI AMR inbox and also keep an eye on our website. We'll be putting updates on the pre-announcement web page to the timeline and any updates that happen in the, in the interim before the call launch. So just keep an eye on our website and as always email us if you've got any questions. And that closes out the session for today. So thank you very much for taking part and looking forward to seeing all your applications come in at the end of the year.